Hello ladies, I'm Mrs. Sherman and I have a blog that I'm making these videos for so I don't have comments here on the channel but I'd appreciate it if you'd go over there and leave a comment and if you have a problem doing that please go to the left and click on my email and just send me an email and tell me what you got done. I, you have to use this video as a, a radio so uh, like it's housewife radio and I'd like you just to use it to keep you company while you work. So you know, homemakers, many of the time, uh, many of them have said the that the isolation was difficult. But when they tried to invite someone over or have company, they couldn't get anything done. And you know, that's the way it is with homemaking and being a wife, mother, and homemaker. It has to be that way. It cannot be done in a group. It's not. It's not like that at all. It actually is. Uh, kind of a republic all by itself and so you're better off by yourself but it's always nice to hear a voice isn't it I remember in the olden times we used to get on the phone with someone uh, set the phone down somewhere and let uh, your friend talk or tell you something while you made the bed or while you did some ironing and so if you've got something you need to do that is uh, rather repetitive or that just needs to be done and is one of those grim jobs I would uh, suggest that you just turn this on and listen as you work. There isn't anything here to see. I'll only show you one thing so that you can get on with your work. Today I am wearing something red and I've had it for years and years and years and I found something in, I've just about done all the teacups that I have and shown you everything that I have and this is one that I have, very similar to one that I showed you before that was called red velvet. Uh, but this is something called Fine China dishwasher safe. That's what it's called. <laughs> so, um, someone gave it to me, and it goes with, doesn't it? So I'll show that, show that to you. And uh, it's really vibrant, isn't it? And speaking of being vibrant, when you come here, I have three sections that I like to divide the talks into, and they are your appearance or getting ready to um, approach your homemaking and the actual homemaking itself and then working around people you know managing while there are people there because that's the way it is at home you know it's isolating but you will have your own family there or you might have someone else there and you have to work around them especially if you're a caregiver to someone or if uh, people have come from the family that uh, need to need to visit you or you need to visit so you need to keep in the front of your mind this goal that you may have to extend throughout the day. You might start, let's say, washing the dishes and, and you get an interruption, but in the front of your mind you're thinking, I'm, I'm going to just temporarily stop and then go back to it. And that's what you do. You go back to it each time until you finish it. You don't give up and say, I couldn't get anything done, they wouldn't let me. You just continue on and you're persistent and you're consistent and you have uh, endurance and there was something else, perseverance. You just persevere. So today I want to talk about appearance first because it's not vain. You know, a lot of people will uh, put you down sometimes and say, you know, women spend too much time on their uh, appearance. But, you know, you have to live with yourself. And if you walk by a mirror and you don't like what you look like, then that's going to depress you and discourage you. And you won't perform the same way at, at home. And how many of you, when you get dressed up, let's say for church, you feel more put together, you stand up straighter, you walk differently, don't you? So why not translate that into the home, which is the most important place in the world? In fact, it is a miniature, um, a miniature society, even a miniature church. You know, it's just miniature. Uh, it's just a little nutshell, a little place where all these important things happen. And a lot of you won't know that until you're my age. <laughs> and so, and I'm not that. Um, I don't feel like I'm that uh, weak, at, you know, being older, because for one thing, I have uh, continued my energy level. I've tried to keep up my energy level from the time I was very young. And so one thing you can do about your energy level is take note of when you seem to be the happiest, when you seem to be the most productive, when you're getting the most done and when you're less discouraged. Take note what time that is and it could have could revolve. I remember years ago that I could not function after four o'clock. I just couldn't. I just I just got ready and, and went to my bedroom and uh, read a book or so I just couldn't move. You couldn't get another ounce of 
work or play out of me or visiting or anything. I was just like out of it but after four o'clock. Well, you know that kind of uh, revolved around and now after four o'clock, I get another uh, four or five hours of pleasure from my house and, and ideas and I get I get to do things and move things around and change sheets and do, do things. I started to enjoy them. Now, years ago, I would have to have a reward. I'd say to myself at the, when, at the end of this, when I get finished with this project or this work here, then I'm going to reward myself with a cup of tea or I'm going to uh, go to the dollar store and, and get, get something for the house, something like that. Well, now it's come to the point where just getting it done is such a pleasure and it's such a reward to stand back and look at something and say it is good. And that's where I get my energy. Now you have to do as much uh, to to give yourself energy as as the energy is taken. So it takes a lot of energy to do certain things, but mentally you have to feed back some kind of energy to yourself. And so that's how it works. You work at this, this grueling work that kind of um, sucks out your energy, but then when you see the result, you feel uh, bolstered up again. So this is so important. Now, I want to remind you again, please don't watch me. Now, the reason I'm out here today, I thought that you might like to see that cute little farmhouse over there uh, in the distance, right there. See, I'm trying to trying to draw a circle around it. <laughs> It's right there in that little circle. Isn't that adorable? Wouldn't that be a cute painting? A little circle with the branches around it and the little red uh, farmhouse in the distance. I think that's a barn. And uh, I always wondered why were barns in America painted red? And are they painted red in other countries? But apparently red was a special kind of paint that was good for weather. I, I am really not sure why barns were painted red. I've, I've gotten on the web and looked it up and I've been very curious about it, but it's changing. You know, now there are some barns that are blue and now there are some barns that are white. But uh, when I was younger, I thought that the cattle and the sheep uh, knew the color red <laughs> and they went wherever there was red. <laughs> so now I want to talk a little bit about getting uh, ready and why I think you should do your hair. You should get you hit in the shower and then do your hair, you know, and when you're dressed and you come out, you're happy. And today I'm wearing uh, red lipstick, of course, to go with the, with the red teacup. And it is called Hot Red and it's from Dollar Tree or there's another store here that sells it for about 97 cents. And I can't remember whether it was Walmart or whether it was the Dollar Tree. Now, Dollar Tree is different than Dollar General. Dollar Tree has actually got some nice quality things in it. Everything is a dollar or less. Sometimes there'll be things two for a dollar. And uh, so what Dollar General is kind of a, to me, it uh, hardly anything in it that's a dollar. And it has a very, uh, a much d more dim atmosphere, a much gloomier atmosphere. Dollar t Tree is light and bright and uh, there's just something different about it, and I like the products much better. But anyway, this is that's the lipstick I'm wearing, and I'm wearing a um, Wet n Wild lip gloss to go on it. And a lot of you like to ask me what it is, and I'll put a picture of it if I can remember on my blog. So why get ready in the morning? Now, if you're not dressed, you might want to turn this off, off or pause it, and go get ready after you hear what I have to say. Because getting dressed, getting ready, and wearing your best gives you a beginning. Who doesn't like a new beginning? Who doesn't like waking up in the morning and knowing it's a new day, all the past uh, problems are behind you from yesterday and you get to start over. And we were taught when we were growing up, you start over every day. You don't bring in all your um, things that you uh, wish you had done the day before. You just start over and just pretend it's a brand new, a brand new effort. And uh, you don't bring in any um, past failures as far as thinking about them and letting it all add up and carrying that burden around. Every day is a new beginning. Isn't that wonderful? And uh, and I like it. I like to get up in the morning and have a new day. And I have noticed that getting up in a good mood depends on what you do the night before, the day before. So it's so interesting that if I get up in the morning and my kitchen is clean. I'm excited. I'm excited to be alive. If my dining room is clean, if things are put away and I walk down the hall and there's nothing down there to uh, remind me of uh, something that didn't get put away or sorted. 
if I walk, can walk into all the rooms and they're in order, no matter how late I stay up, no matter how exhausted I am getting that done, the next day it I am just in an incredibly good mood. So if you have trouble with moods, why don't you try that? Just put on that little extra burst of energy before you go to bed. Get everything ready. Lay out your clothes. We used to do that. Do you remember when we were kids, we laid out our clothes. It was important to us. And somewhere along the line in the uh, prevailing culture, we were given the message that it wasn't clothes aren't really that important. The color's not important. The, you know, selecting them and everything. Just throw on something. And I don't know where, you know, why. Just seems like. Uh, the prevailing cultural in general around us don't really care. But at home, let's care. This is such a blessed place. This is such a wonderful place. So if you have not done that, if you have not gotten your appearance ready, please go and do that all the way to um, uh, cleaning your, your face and your teeth and your hair and fixing yourself up, even if it takes a little time. And like I said, when, you're, when you've got children around you, sometimes they can come in when you're fixing your hair they observe what you do and when you're brushing your teeth they observe this they're going to they're going to catch your good habits and if if you if you teach them as you go you know say now uh, your mother's going to brush your teeth and this is how we do it and that way you don't have to shut the door on them all the time if they are wanting to be with you so there are some things that you can do around, many things that you can do around children. And you can sit down with your little list and say, today I'm going to do this and this, and you're going to help me do this and this. And they know that you have a purpose in life, and they know that they're going to tag along with you. So now we want to, um, I want to go back from yesterday when I was talking about how you put things in an order to which you use them. Like, for instance, I talked about the upper shelves in your kitchen where you put your cooking ingredients, and then there's a little drawer where you put the spoons and the measuring spoons and the measuring cups and the mixing spoons, and then there's a, another shelf underneath there where you put your mixing bowls and your baking pans. Well, I also forgot to tell you, you get all that stuff out and you, you place the bowl right there on the cabinet top or the bench top, right below the cabinet that has all the ingredients. You don't take your mixing bowl and go further on down to the end of your kitchen and mix things. You, everything happens right there. And then, of course, hopefully, that's all near where you're going to, where the oven is. So that way you, have, you don't have a lot of steps. You're not tripping over things. Uh, you're, not, uh, you're not distracted. It's all there in one spot. And I hope you can get that. And if you do, please leave me a comment to know that I've been somewhat effective with that explanation. So somebody asked me about um, teaching children and what would you do with the little ones while you taught an older one? Well, I've been thinking about that. And I tried with mine with homeschooling to get away from the public school system, but I didn't, co I didn't completely manage that because there was one thing that I just now... Uh, there's just a light bulb went on in my head that, well, hey, we didn't really uh, completely get away from their system. And one thing was they have everything divided up into ages and grades so that uh, a six-year-old will or a seven-year-old, by the way, it's not really wise to uh, teach them that young as far as close-up work because their eyes and ears are not fully developed until they're about nine or ten. So you don't want to uh, get them too early teaching, uh, learning close-up work, reading and writing and that sort of thing, because they that doesn't mean you can't read a story to them, because um, that, that could be part of the problem. So many children have um, uh, eyesight and hearing problems. They're just not ready. They're just not fully developed. But anyway, they divided in the public school, they divided you up into age groups and grades for all your materials. And I was thinking about this one mother that um, had uh, had about three children so far, and she said that uh, the oldest one, she taught him to read and write, and the younger ones were sitting on her lap at the same time. And she said when, she, when it finally became uh, to where the youngest one was of the age to, to take those same lessons, uh, he, he, was, he already knew them because he had sat through the first child, and he'd sat through the second child, and then it was his turn. He already knew all that. So I would say, this is what I would say. Get duplicates of the books or 
duplicate them yourself, copy them yourself, or write a little book yourself. Write the lesson out yourself uh, three times or two times and give a copy to each child. And that way, uh, you see, you can't fool these younger ones because they know when they're being put aside. They know when they're not being part of what's going on. They know you've just given them something over here to keep them quiet. They kind of know. And uh, if you've got one that's not content with what you gave them to do, maybe coloring or something like that, then you just get just get two lessons and give one to each. It doesn't matter if the little one doesn't quite get it. Give them a pencil and let them do it and uh, tutor them both. And, and you'll uh, have a lot less of a struggle making the other one, you know, give you the space and the time and the quietness if you will include them in the lesson. And you, you, you know your child better than I do. Perhaps you know what would make them uh, more content and happy. And uh, one thing I know, it doesn't, it doesn't work to uh, push them aside. So, so uh, the other thing I want to talk to you about, I think it's probably going to be a very short video because I can see that it is getting dark out here. Um, everyone in the house is busy with something else and I just needed to come out here so that I could talk. And uh, hopefully my camera will still have some light on it on me so you can see if you need to. One thing about hospitality to keep you from being anxious or nervous about it is to just practice it on your own family. Use good table settings. You know, use, use uh, whatever you want. Uh, make it so that there are you have a, a set of menus or even tea foods that you're good at and use them on your family. Get so used to it that if someone comes over or someone needs for you to have a little luncheon or a tea for them, that it's not a great stress. You just pick up your old uh, familiar recipes or you things that you've memorized, things that you know that you do well. And so always practice using the best on your family. I know there are some families that they're saving their good china for I don't know what, but get it out and use it. I read somewhere a book, you know, I have all these books and I'm trying to go through them and eliminate them, see what I want to keep, what I want. There was one called Your Children Don't Want Your Stuff. It was really depressing, you know, about this next generation really doesn't want your grandmother's wedding china. So I thought to myself, uh, of course, some, some kids will, but just in general, you know, I thought to myself, why not use it? So get it out and use it because the queen isn't coming and you may not have uh, another event. I have a granddaughter and she was born on Christmas Day and she just naturally wants to celebrate everything, and which is wonderful because she gets out my teacups and all my good dishes and all the little crystal bowls and things that I've collected over the years from... Uh, various places and puts things in them and and we have tea we have meals and so let them use that stuff and they know children know the difference between a paper plate and a plastic bowl and a piece of fine china they know the difference and what I have noticed is it's not the children that have a problem using the fine china teacup it's not the child that has the problem it's the parents I'll have people over and so I'll set the children to some of these. And I don't have any you can't use, and I don't have any delicate antiques. They're just, they're all very usable. If they break, hey, there's more where those came from. It's always fun to go shopping and look for some, so it doesn't bother me. And uh, so I give, I let the children have these, and they just love what it sounds like when you set the cup in the saucer. They love to run the spoon inside, and it tinkles, and it has a, a melody sort of all its own. They just love to slurp it and... Um, play like tea and I heard a lady say to me the other day that she had the parents the mother was the one that was nervous didn't want her to give the children her teacups to drink out of during this tea party they were having at her home it was an afternoon tea with all the sandwiches and the scones and everything and so she had gone and found a little tin set and to serve that to the children but even then uh the mother was, she was sort of nervous about it, but the uh, the hostess said, well, I, I'd just like to see, you know, just, just let me serve them in the china. And one of the boys, uh, he really liked the tea, and he was pouring a lot of milk in his to cool it down, and he said, you know, and he's very young, and he said, no, it's so nice to have real tea, because 
most of the time when we have tea, it's just pretend tea. <laughs> And we're just, we just play with these little tea sets. He says, it's really nice to have real tea. So these children, absolutely, uh, from the time mine were little, they always had these, the teacups and the ordinary glass china, and we did not feed them out of, uh, you know, paper plates and plastic bowls and things like that. Of course, when they're, when they're toddlers and they're throwing things down, of course, you, you want to be careful not to give them valuable things, of course. So... In the table settings, do something in your home so that you're not just throwing the food on the table and uh, everybody's reaching. And you know, try to have a little bit of formality so that if you do happen to have company, you can start. You can ease into it just by practicing with your own family. Now, before I go, I want to say a, a few things about. Being uh, on being bright, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and on the bright side of things. Now we've all we're going to go get into the people part now, okay? And we all have family members that were gloomy or always had something to say that was the opposite. Now let me give you an example of a bad habit that's that might start in the teenage years. And if if you cannot correct this in the teenage years, then you'll become an elderly person that is grumpy and seems to be harsher. I don't know why it is, but you know, you can say the same thing when you're older and it sometimes comes across as rather um, bristly. And remember in the Anne of Green Gables how Catherine was sort of bristly and uh, she had a, you know, kind of cutting in her, her remarks. And so one of the things that people say sometimes that really doesn't go over too well that you might want to think about and see if you're, uh, I'd like to have a little quiz sometime with you to see how how positive you are. I know that sounds like a, a 1960s phrase, but I can't think of anything else. But how encouraging are you? And when someone says, um, oh, it's nice to see children so well-mannered, you know, uh, because I'm afraid sometimes people are a little bit reluctant to have them in their home because they're afraid they're going to tear it up. And, and these children are so well-mannered. And then someone says, well, not all children are that nice. Or you say, this is a lovely day. And the next couple of days, we're going to have sunshine, apparently, and uh, really enjoy it. And the other person is quick to say, well, it's not going to last that long. Now, that is a person that seems to be, either they think that that is the way to converse, and that's the only way they know how, or that is how they get their uh, courage to say things like that, or they are avoiding uh, assenting and accepting something. So the best way, uh, they don't want to say, I don't believe it, you're wrong, so they just say, well, not, all, not everything's nice, well, not everything is, uh, you know, whatever. And that it, it, it prevents them from having to make any kind of commitment to niceness or goodness. And if you want to know more about that, watch the uh, episode of Anna Green Gables when she had a, a friend who was a fellow teacher in this college that she was teaching named Catherine. And she invited her to, her, uh, to Green Gables and uh, had a talk with her about how prickly she was. <laughs> so, ladies, I've only been talking for about 23 minutes. It's getting a little bit dark. I don't know how much longer I can go. And in the distance, you might see some lights come on. I don't know if there's anyone actually over there. Uh, that's a barn that's quite a ways away from the, from the house. And so I have, uh, I have notes here that I can't read because they're too dark. So what I would like to say in, um, in closing is I hope that you will find a way to make your children and your family feel happier that you were there, happier because of you, happier uh, to leave them feeling encouraged. And encourage your husband how to encourage men. That's really, really important. And I think one of the things that encourages a man the most about uh, his wife being a homemaker and being home is the fact that she manages well and that the house uh, is comfortable and that the, that there's good food there. I think those things are just the most important and that it's it's a nice place to be. 
and that he doesn't have to uh, move a pile of stuff in order to get into his chair or get to sleep at night or anything like that, that, uh, that she's thoughtful enough to make a home for him. And in the olden days, up in Alaska, we had these uh, bachelors that had cabins, and they would uh, try to find these mail-order brides because even though it's nice, you know, to be uh, alone and to be independent and stuff, they always thought that a woman lighted the home. A woman made the home a, a, a more joyous and better place. And we need to go back to believing that so that you have a purpose in doing that and making it a better place. Because any, any husband can have a place of his own. Any man can have a place of his own and function just fine. But a, a woman, a wife, makes it a better place and makes it a happier place. And if you can think of ways to do that, then do that and take note of how much more content you all are to be at home. And one of the reasons I think, uh, you know, Mr. S and I decided to get married is that we had a place to go so that we could be with each other and you didn't have to uh, go somewhere else. You know, you didn't have to spend money. You didn't have to go anywhere else. And dating was not very interesting in those days. So we, we were happy to have a home. So make your home a place where your family is happy and that you're happy too. Now, I'm afraid I'm going to have to say goodbye because it's getting so dark here and there's there's no lights and, well, there are a few lights in the distance, but uh, I want to say God bless you and please leave a comment because that's what I thrive on are these comments and gives me ideas. Make a list and leave it for me and send me an email. Thank you and God bless. Goodbye.